Hi guys, uh, my name is Sayaman. I'll be running you through the introductory part of our presentation. A topic is how the natural fractures affect the hydraulic fracture geometry and hydraulic fracture stimulation. This of course involves uh, extended finite element method, the XFAM. Before we jump into XFAM, I'd like to throw some light on the finite element method analysis. So let's go through that first. So the finite element method or finite element analysis uh, is a numerical method used to solve engineering problems and uh, it uses an array of mathematical techniques. The name comes from the fact that the method uh, sub subdivides a larger problem into smaller simpler parts that are called finite elements and these elements consist of nodes and they can be of many different types like a, a triangular element, a trapezoidal or any of the such type and the equations that model these finite elements are solved and assembled back into the larger system of equations which uh, in itself models the entire problem. XFAM is a numerical method which involves local enrichment or local elements at all the nodes which are close to the discontinuity and uh, it uses the concept of partitioning of unity. Now, why do we go for XFEM? Uh, when you consider a uh, finite element method, whenever we encounter discontinuities such as uh, singularities, localized deformations, fractures, cracks, or complex geometries, we need to go for remeshing every time we encounter such problems. But when you consider XFEM, it, uh, you can say that it tries to cheat the system and allows uh, mesh manipulation. And it also adjusts the approximate space by incorporating enriched nodes or enrich enrichment functions across the discontinuity so that there is no need for uh, mesh refinement. So coming to advantages of XFEM, uh, as I've already told you before, uh, with complicated geometries, it can be modeled very easily. And uh, with uh, enriched, but the thing is with enriched elements, the uh, we need additional degrees of freedom at crack surface and crack tips. And uh, also the discontinuous shape function is used to capture the singularity of the stress field near the crack. Uh, it is also convenient to implement in commercial software with parallel computing and uh, can also solve multi-material or multi-phase problem like uh, like a bimaterial or alloys or something like that. So when we compare XFEM with FEM, the idea is the discontinuity is independent of the finite element mesh while the advantages uh, which you already know of using XFEM is that there's no requirement for remeshing more uh, remeshing and uh, moreover enrichment functions are evaluated in XFEM but the number of degrees of freedom are more in XFEM compared to the FEM moreover uh, we also require special integration techniques for discontinuous elements in the XFEM method coming to the historical background uh, Belitsko and Black were the initial ones who came up with the FEM uh, method idea and they worked on problems such as crack growth problems which involves uh, minimal remeshing and after that Moise and Dolbo uh, they actually uh, came up with the extended finite element method they improved the finite element method analysis and they named it as fi uh, extended finite element method and they they were the ones who introduced the enrichment functions at the crack, tri crack tips or crack growth Dolbo was the one who came up with the extended finite element method and uh, he also worked on cohesive crack growth in XFEM. Up to this point, the XFEM analysis was uh, mostly in 2D, but after Sukumar came, like uh, he extrapolated the technique to the three-dimensional uh, crack modeling. And he also introduced, which is, which, which is famously known as the discontinuous enrichment function. Chesso mainly worked on the fluid mechanics uh, aspect of the pro analysis and uh, he worked on mainly the two-phase immiscible flow problems and he also improved on the blending element performance using the strain method. So I'm going to be talking about hydraulic fracture stimulation which is also known as fracking and uh, the fracking involves a vertical drilling of pipe into the ground for several uh, hundreds of meters and then at some point uh, the pipe turns orthogonally to the initial direction and the, and the pipe you see here which I'm highlighting right now is the pipe which is inserted into the rock under the bed and uh, the fractures are incorporated using a hydraulic liquid which is uh, pumped at high pressures. These liquids uh, come out through the perforation clusters which you see here. So these are known as the perforation clusters. 
and we have several stages uh, in this like stage uh, each of these are different stages along the pipeline and uh, what will we be uh, what we'll be aiming today is uh, to talk about the stress relationships that are important to consider when you are completing your well so the main focus here is the orientation of the horizontal well which you see right here this is the horizontal well and for, for, for its orientation we should be knowing the direction of the maximum shear stress which is in this direction and the minimum shear stress in which is in this direction this area is known as a perforation cluster and also keep in mind that this is a, a plan view of the horizontal well which uh, which means that we are looking vertically above from the map view of this horizontal well so this is, this is a plan view just keep in mind and this is known as a perforation cluster through which we inject the hydraulic fluid through which the hydraulic fractures propagate and once we are in the vicinity of this perforation cluster uh, we are going to have a lot of stimulation in the region adjacent to this hydraulic fracture the hydraulic fracture uh, if you think about hydraulic fracture uh, it's an it's nothing but a tensile fracture and it's generally quiet and it's also aseismic uh, for the most part you don't hear it and uh, the fractures we do here are those that are created by shear failure along the natural fractures in the reservoir so coming to the vicinity of the perforation cluster this is what it looks like and this is the direction of the maximum shear stress and this is the direction of the minimum shear stress the blue lines indicate the hydraulic fractures which are propagating and the black lines these are the black lines which are the natural fractures which are already present and the blue ones are the hydraulic fractures so which of these two fractures is likely to open up and the fractures which are related at low uh, lower angle uh, compared to sh max that which are the hydraulic fractures these fractures are a little longer low angle but they aren't failing as we speak uh, they are stable However, if we change the initial stress condition, then maybe we can open these fractures. So we drill our well perpendicular to SH max. We go through the hydraulic fracture stimulation of the reservoir stage by stage. So we are pushing fluids into the reservoir, uh, decreasing the effective stress. And we produce failure <coughs> on these fractures, uh, which were optimally oriented with respect to the SH max. As you can see in this diagram, uh, the, I've highlighted two types of fractures here, the ones in the red and the ones in the black. The ones in the red are uh, usually oriented at uh, fairly low angles uh, compared to the SH max, while the ones in blue are against the SH max, uh, we are, we are, as the intuition says, these cracks are held together by the SH max and so they do not usually crack. But uh, and these prob cracks are, are probably not going to move. Nothing's going to happen to them. But the but these fractures, the red ones, <coughs> are uh, are going to move because they are already oriented at a fairly low angle to the SH max. Um, may uh, failure may occur if we reduce the effective stress here. So uh, if we go through the simulation process, uh, we see rupture along these natural fractures. Uh, we hear these events. These are relatively smaller in magnitude and these are the events that we hear when the hydraulic fracture deforms due to the tensile failure. Uh, we tend not to hear the uh, ripping noises of fault as a fracture, uh, fracture tip propagates uh, but uh, what we do hear is a slippage on either side of these natural fractures which are relatively small. Mm, they might be about the size of your desktop to the size of your office floor uh, depending on the size of your office floor. So the, uh, these would be known as the micro seismic events uh, that you hear mostly during a hydraulic fracture simulation. And the ones are, which I've highlighted using the red dots here, these are the cause of the uh, micro seismic events. So uh, I want to show you an example here. Uh, we usually frack from toe to heel and um, uh, you know depending on on the stress conditions the local structure some areas and also uh, the placement of your observation well it can drastically affect the density of micro seismic events that you hear uh, that you hear sh max in this case uh, is oriented in this direction which i'm highlighting right now it's slightly oblique and you can see that we are able to identify trends uh, trends or failures in the micro seismic activity you can see it right here 
which has been in uh, this micro seismic activity uh, has been induced in the reservoir and you can see that it generally tends to be at a small angle to sh max as we've expected so the total heel fracking uh, and you'll often see the events created during individual stages uh, of hydro uh, hydraulic fracture stimulation they glide along the direction of dominant natural fracture systems in the area hi my name is juan and um I will be starting on the general principles part for the um, XFEM method. So starting on the background and applications, um, the extended finite element method, which is uh, XFEM, is a numerical method that is developed on base, um, based on the classical finite element method, which is the standard FEM to provide more solution space for the solutions of uh, differential equations with discontinuous functions. So this can be used to solve problems with localized features that can't be resolved by mesh refinement. An initial application of XFEM was the modeling of fractures in a material. In this scenario, discontinuous basis functions are added to the polynomial basics uh, basis functions for nodes that belong to the element intersect, intersected by a crack to provide a model which included crack opening displacements. In this way, the utilization of uh, XFEM enabled no necessary update for the finite element mesh that is needed to track the crack path. And um, uh, still, the basic concepts are the application of uh, XFEM involves understanding of the partition of unity method, which is the PUM method, where enrichment functions are added to the standard approximation space. As we can see, these uh, three figures over here on the left, that um, so the left side is the crack propagation in a plate with the hole, and in the middle is the standard FEM using the adaptive mesh refinement. And on the right is uh, the enriched FEM using uh, uniform mesh. Element cut by interface are enriched. We can see over here in the uh, uh, yellow, yellow circle. And um, the enrichment approximation is the, um, presented as U of X equals the summation of uh, NI of X times ui plus the enrichment terms which i will be explaining in the later contents so for the pum method the arbitrary discontinuities can be treated on a fixed fixed mesh but additional unknowns will be overwhelming for computation while um, the xfem minimize the number of uh, additional unknowns by using local intrinsic enrichment of the approximation space. Um, uh, so as we talk about the enrichment functions, the purpose is to use the information obtained from the an analytical solution to provide a more accurate uh, approximation. We have uh, two types of enrichment. Um, first type is the intrinsic enrichment which is uh, in enriching the basic vector. And we also have the extrinsic enrichment, which is uh, enriching the approximation. Um, as we can see over here, um, we will first discuss about the intrinsic in enrichment. So in this method, we are enriching the basic basis vector. The process is to improve the accuracy of the approximation by including new terms and uh, new basis functions. So in the in the beginning, we talked about this function, um, uh, this basic function for u of x equals the summation of n i of x times u i, where n is the set of all nodal points, and n i of x are the standard shape functions, u i are the standard nodal degree of freedom, and then u of x is the um, approximation space. So um, this is the standard approximation. When we try to improve the approximation space, we have these following functions with the um, inclusion of uh, AI and um, N subscript of T of X 
times a. So we have um, p in this function, uh, the p is the uh, unknown unknown like p over here on the top of the summation is the number of nodes around the corresponding node and ni of x are the standard shape functions again and ai is the uh, vector of coefficients obtained from one of the least squares techniques and then u, u of x is the approximation space we also have the n of x equals here which um as a as a function of uh, n as stand standard of x um, and then n enriched of x so we have n subscript of standard of x is the standard polynomial functions ni of x and then the enriched form the enriched term the n enriched of x is the enriched shape functions obtained from uh, ni of x times pj of x so in this method there are no additional unknowns included and then we will go on, go on and discuss about the extrinsic enrichment. So in this method, we are uh, enriching the approximation by adding enrichment functions to the standard approximation mentioned previously. Um, the enrichment functions in PUM, which is the um, partition of unity method er, uh, mentioned earlier, is required over the whole domain, while the XFEM uses the local extrinsic enrichment. Um, this will save a lot of calculation time and memory storage. Um, so we have these following functions um, for the extrinsic enrichment. We can see that there is an additional term that is added over here um, representing uh, the enrichment for, uh, the re enrichment terms. And these can be written as uh, two forms where MK um, uh, which is a subset of n are the set of nodal points enriched by the enrichment functions um, psi k of x. Um, we want to say that note that the enhanced terms are obtained by multiplying um, psi k of x by standard uh, shape functions ni of x. So let's talk about some techniques used for enrichment functions. Um, as we know in XDF uh, XFEM different problems require specific enrichment functions which are related to the discontinuity discontinu type and their influence on the solution form. And the techniques are based on some of the following functions. The sine distance functions as a type of uh, the level set function. And we also have the branch function and the heavy side jump function. Uh, I want to mention that the selection of functions as an uh, enrichment function are dependent on the type of discontinuity. The first, first type of discontinuity due to, is due to the material property. On the left, you can see the figures on the left, which is the bimaterial interface. That is the weak discontinuity. Discontinu we also have the discontinuity due to different um, displacement fields. And in this case, we will use the heavy side function which is, uh, we can see on the right that there's the crack interface, which represents the strong discontinuity. And we can see on the graph that um, uh, the, the white part um, is the standard node and the red part is the enriched nodes. The blue part is the standard element and the yellow part is the enriched element. In the level set method, um, also, I want to discuss about the sine distance functions in the uh, level set method. So some functions that we use as the enrichment functions for the weak discontinuities are the level set function. And um, the sine distance function as a, uh, is a common type of the level set function. So the level set function uh, method is a, a numerical method used for tracking move, moving interfaces. In this method, the interface is representing the zero level set of function and it is one dimension higher than the interface dimension. The most common function for this method is the sine di distance function. The example are as follows. On the left side um, represents the bimaterial interface, which is the weak discontinuity. On the right side, we have the crack interface, which we can see in the, in the middle of the figure 
uh, that represents the the strong discontinuity continuity. So two domains, omega A and omega B, with um, gamma D as the interface. We can see gamma D is in the middle, and we can see the two um, interfaces, which is uh, omega A and omega B, in the um, figures on the left side. They are um, uh, omega B is in the uh, small circle and omega A is the larger larger circle. And on the right right side figure, omega A is the is the right side of the um, domain and the omega B is the left side of the domain. Um, so continuing on discussing the sine distance function. Um, uh, the sine distance function for representing the interface position is um, the following equation, which is uh, phi of x equals the um, uh, the uh, Euclidean norm of uh, x minus x star um, sine function, which is the um, sigma function of uh, of n r d times x minus x star. So you have x star is the closest point projection projection of x onto the discontinuity gamma d. Um, discontinuity is right here in the graph as we can see. So n n of uh, subscript of r d is the normal vector to the interface at point x star. We also have the uh, Euclidean norm of x minus x star is the distance of point x to the discontinuity gamma d. We can see that the sine, um, I want, also want to mention in this uh, equation that the sine function, this is the signum function, um, is a, a mat mathematical function that extracts the sine of a real number. So we can see that the sine is different on two sides of the closed interface. So the discontinuity can be represented by the contour of the level set function below. We have um, phi of x equals uh, if it's larger than zero, greater than zero. If um, x is uh, uh, the, an element of omega a, and is um, the phi of x is equal to zero if um, x is an element of gamma d, and then it is uh, smaller than zero if um, x is an element of omega b. So for weak discontinuity discontinu across the interface. The level set function can be used as an enrichment function. Then we're going to go ahead and talk about the heavy side function. For strong discontinuity occurrence in crack problems, the kinematics of this discontinuity can be defined using the heavy side function. There's two ways of defining the heavy side function, which is as follows the uh, h of x is the heavy side function equal to 0 or 1 depending on whether um, phi of x is smaller than zero or uh, larger than zero. We also have, um, and this is the common heavy side uh, step function. We also have the uh, heavy side sine function, which is uh, h of x equals minus one or plus one, um, depending on whether um, phi of x is smaller than zero or greater than zero. So phi of x, Rep is uh, representing the sine distance function earlier mentioned. When avoiding numerical problems such as instabilities, it is uh, necessary to use a smooth heavy side function such as the following. Um, uh, this is the smooth heavy side function, which is uh, h of x equals zero and equals to um, one half plus uh, phi divided by um, uh, two epsilon plus one over two pi times sine of um, pi times uh, pi times phi divided by epsilon, and then also equal to one, depending on those uh, three different con uh, different conditions. Also, want to note that um, uh, epsilon is a small value comparing to the element size. And based on the heavy side function, the approximation field can be written as uh, the following form. So u of x of uh, the summation of ni of x times u of i plus the summation of uh, nj of x times the heavy side function times the a of j. And um, applying the heavy side function, we get the um, results on the right. 
So now for the summary of the general principle parts, we have the strong discontinuities continuities um, with crack cross and embedded term. Um, we have these following four uh, essential like uh, equations that's used. So first we have the u of x function. We can see that um, uh, this is the, the basis form for the enrichment. Um, the middle the middle term uh, stands for the enrichment. And then we also have the um, phi of x over here. This is the near crack tip displacement field, which will be added on the as a uh, additional term for the u of x. Um, and then we also have the um, heavy side function um, used for the strong discontinuities, which is equal to zero and one depending on different conditions. And we also have the phi of x, uh, uh, the um, the sine function over over here down here. And then for weak discontinuities, the strain field is uh, discontinu continuous due to different material. And we have the two following equations, um, which is that u of x equals the summation of um, ni of x times ui of t, um, plus the summation of nj of x times the uh, phi of x times qj. And phi of x is the, uh, uh, the presentation is um, down here. Um, uh, it's the last equation. And we have a subscript of j and b subscript of k and q of j are the degree of freedoms. And the two, first two are the enriched. The third one is not enriched. Okay, now we're going to look at the governing equations section of our XFEM. So how do we make this work? What can we do with what we've described in our general description to formulate usable equations uh, that will allow us to implement XFEM? And sort of the end result we want, I've laid out here. And then we basically want a relation between the stiffness matrix and our force vector. This is pretty straightforward. It's pretty much what you would guess. Uh, in 2D there, I've given a 2D example as well, the 2D formulation that we're going to get to at the end of this little section of the slide. So a preview of what we're doing. Next question is, how do we get there? OK, so now we're looking at a sample domain we've come up with. This is a good way to illustrate and think through these governing equations. And this domain is omega. It's divided into two subdomains, omega plus and omega minus. And the interesting thing about these is that rather than having just one big boundary, which we normally call gamma, they actually have omega plus has its boundary gamma plus and omega minus has its boundary omega minus and between them they have this uh, gamma d boundary which represents our discontinuity between the uh, two halves of our uh, omega omega plus omega minus how do we get there the domain is currently in equilibrium this is something very important to emphasize. So if it's equilibrium, the stiffness matrix and the force matrix uh, should be in balance, k, u, minus f, zero. We'll want to define our boundary conditions. We have displacement. We have traction, normally defined. And then we have this discontinuity boundary, which is something we really don't see in other places. And here, sigma n gamma d equals t d when we have weak dis discontinuity and then interestingly if we have a strong discontinuity sigma n gamma d is going to be equal to zero with our two domains omega plus and omega minus we're going to need to relate them somehow and the way we can do that beautifully is the divergence theorem, a.k.a. the graus green theorem. And this theorem allows us to integrate over a boundary, in this case boundary gamma, for a continuous function f. 
And what's really neat about this theorem is that you'll note on the left-hand side of the top equation there, our integration uh, over the entire omega uh, is broken down in the bottom equation so that the integration over the entire omega is made up of the parts of the integration over omega plus and integration over omega minus. So now we've broken down these two. Putting the divergence theorem in terms for our own domain omega, uh, we see that the integration of div f across omega can be thought of as the integration of the entire boundary minus the integration of that inner division we have. Uh, which is our discontinuity. Uh, interestingly, you break that down, you see that um, we have f plus there and f minus. That would be the discontinuity, the um, boundary between omega plus and omega minus. That would equal zero if you're in total equilibrium. So basically, we've just restated the divergence theorem but added this extra term. And when that's not exactly zero, that's when things get interesting. So that's just a little bit for our domain that we'll use in a second. So like in the last slide, again, it's important to note that we're in equilibrium for all of omega. And we can point this out with a little equation here, del sigma plus b equals zero across that domain. Uh, if we then want to integrate across the domain using the test function, uh, given there and integrate, integrate it across omega, this will equal zero, hence being in equilibrium. Using the divergence theorem along with our test function, we get this equation. What's really interesting to note is the second integral there, we're in integrating along gamma d, um, with respect to the delta u term in there, uh, it's interesting to know that we can cancel that out in the case of our weak um, form. We see below that the uh, term would cancel on one side versus the other, the plus side or the other side. And then in the strong form, if there were a strong discontinuity, then that would be zero in the first place. So canceling those terms out gets us to the bottom equation, and this is the heart of XFEM. This is what we've been looking to get to in terms of the governing equations. And this is what we wanted to get. This allows us to have that discontinuity within our uh, domain omega and remain stable. So from here, we can go on and discretize uh, this and take into account our sine distance function and our heavy side step function. And so now we see the equations for displacement. And in the 2D discrete case, we have a matrix for the standard or a matrix for the enriched displacements. And same with strain. Again, we have matrix for the standard and matrix for the enriched. And so we reach this form for our final equations, relating force and stiffness. Moving on, we will apply these to some examples. Let's go on and talk about the hand calculation example um, for the XFBM. So a good example is the cracked 1D truss member example. And um, the following figure is the 1D bar with the length of 3L as defined. And in this problem, we assign E to be the elastic moduli and A as the cross-sectional area of the 1D bar. So we have one side of the bar is subjected to a prescribed displacement, um, U, which is the, um, the right side of the bar. Another side is fixed is the left side of bar, while the bar is cracked in the middle of, uh, of 
at 1.5L length. You can see in the middle that is cracked. And um, then we want to talk about the standard FEM solution uh, with the non-aligned mesh. So this is the standard FEM solution. Um, I will be talking about the XFEM solution uh, with non-aligned mesh um, in the following. So you, and, and then we want to compare the two methods. So um, the standard FEM solution is the um, for this method, the finite element mesh must be aligned with the crack. And then we have a, a presentation over here that um, we have the um, FEM discretization of 1D trust member. We have E uh, elastic moduli and, um, and A over here. And uh, you can see that there are four sections. One, uh, one section's uh, length is L, and then two sections in the middle are 0.5L. And then the other section is uh, the um, length is also L. We have the finite element mesh must be must be aligned with the crack, and then we see the following um, following figure that the degrees of freedoms, which are U1 through U4, um, associated with each node as the unknowns. So talking about the standard FEM solution with the um, non-aligned mesh, mesh, we have uh, K equals Ea divided by L times the stiffness matrix. Um, the stiffness matrix uh, represents the system of linear equations and needs to be uh, solved in order to ascertain and approximate solutions to solution to a, a different um, equation. And then we also have the linear system of equations in the matrix form on the right and applying the natural and essential boundary conditions, um, uh, which is the F1 through F4, we can solve for the four unknowns, which is the um, in, in the right um, bottom corner. And so uh, let's go on. And now we're moving on to the XFEM solution with non-aligned mesh in this uh, method and this is a problem problem solving mesh, mesh process using the extended finite element method and um, in this process the non-aligned mesh can be present we have three sections um, as we can see is uh, the uh, that are equal lengths of l and this is the xfem discretization of 1d trust member and uh, when non-aligned mesh mesh is shown the F, F, FEM method, the standard method, fails to identify the discontinuity and gives us a wrong solution. So therefore, in this case, we use, need to use the XFEM method. Since a strong discontinuity is present in the displacement field in the middle of the bar, the step function is used in this case as an enrichment function. We can see that on the uh, bottom left corner, we have this graph. Um, uh, which is the standard and enriched degrees of freedoms as uh, associated with each nodes. Uh, we can see that the, the, the standard nodes and then our, uh, the standard degree of freedom, which is the U's, and then the enriched degrees of freedom, which is A. And then go on, uh, continue with the S XFEM solution. Um, we, ha we can see that on the left side, this is the discretized domain used for the analysis. And on the right side, uh, in the middle and the right figure represents the step function um, over the support of node x2 and x3 shape functions. We have x1 through x4 representing the nodes and the nodal support of node x2 and x3 we can see um, in the left left figure um, on the top that they are cut by the cracks so we enrich these two nodes using a step function and this enables two additional agree of a degree of freedoms for nodes x2 and x3 and then the structure stand holds six degrees free the uh, de degree of freedoms uh, four is the u1 uh, u1 u2 u3 and u4 and then the enriched are the a1 and a2 um, in the previous slide.
So for any elements, the XFEM stiffest matrix can be written as right here in the left corner um, uh, with K and um, uh, different uh, the KUU and KUA and um, KAAs have each have their own um, uh, representation on the right. So as we can see, um, this solution involves um, the analysis of uh, three elements, which is the uh, first element is the um, omega-1, and the second element is omega-2, and the third element is omega-3 um, in the uh, top left corner. And first we want to talk about element 1, omega-1. Um, the enrichment function h of x equals uh, plus 1 in this case for um, x as an element of uh, omega-1. So we have on the left side, we see that the, um, uh, the n subscript of standard uh, n of u subscript stand, standard is uh, one the matrix form is one minus x divided by l and we also have x divided by l on the right and we also have the different presentations of the um, the enriched form of n and the standard form of b and the enriched form of b following and then we have the using using these we are able to um, identify the KUU and the KUA in this case, um, which is uh, uh, applied, which is uh, equals to the KUU equals the EA divided by L. And um, we have um, the matrix on the right, and then the EU, uh, KUA is equal to EA divided by L. We have the um, small matrix on the right. So since uh, we know we have this condition, um, KAU equals KUA subscript of T, and we have um, KAA equals EA divided by L. So now we can get the um, KE1 equals the EA divided by L, which is the n times the uh, matrix over here on the right. And then we also uh, go on on next element number two, which is omega two. Um, this is the most important element in this solution, um, which is in the middle, and we have the enrichment functions for element two for the, both the nodes. Um, uh, so so one, one side is omega two plus, and the other side is um, omega two minus for the two sides of uh, the omega two element. We have the enrichment functions equals plus one if um, x as an element of omega two plus, and then uh, h of x equals minus 1 for x as an element of omega 2 minus. And um, applying the uh, similar conditions over here, and then we have the um, KUU over, over here on the right. That's uh, a part of the stiffness matrix. And um, so um, right here, I want to mention that element two contain, contains a discontinuity. So integrated integration is performed on the uh, omega two plus sign and omega two minus to integrate properly on both sides of discontinuity. Then we have the following uh, forms. We have KUA equals and KAU and KAA on the left side. And then we also have the, um, I also put the, the enrichment functions on the right side. And integrating on um, omega two plus um, using the h of x equals plus one, and we also have uh, to integrate on omega two minus sign using the h of x equals uh, minus one. So we did we do both of them, and we have the following, and then we we determine the the matrix for k u a and k a a on both sides. Then we will. Then, then after that, we will combine combine the results of the integration on both sides of the discontinuity and obtain the following form. So we have KUA equals uh, EA divided by 2L and the um, middle matrix, and um, the KUA equals EA divided by 2L and uh, in the uh, middle section of matrix, and we have a final answer. And since we know that KAU equals uh, uh, the transpose of uh, KUA. 
So then the stiffest matrix can be written as the following form on the bottom um, for uh, element two. So basically, we need to um, uh, 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 separate the element two equals into two parts, which is the omega omega two plus and omega two minus, and then integrate them to get our um, components for our stiffest matrix, and then we add them together to get our final stiffest matrix for element two. And then element three is uh, very similar to element one which is omega 3 and the enrichment functions for this one is uh, h of x equals minus 1 for x as an element of uh, omega 3. So similar to um, uh, element 1 we have um, the following enriched and standard form of n and b and we also have the, uh, the following um, uh, forms of kuu and kua and then we have using KAU equals KUA transpose, we have the um, result of KAA, and then now we can um, we can write the form the the uh, the stiffness matrix uh, for the element three, which is omega three, as the uh, in the in the right um, bottom corner. And now using the three. Um, stiffest matrix for element one and element two and element three, we can write the, the final uh, structure stiffest matrix over here on the left. And then we have the system of equations to solve with um, applications of boundary conditions. Um, so this is a linear system of equations that needs to be solved again. And we can see from this nodal, we can see from uh, this nodal, nodal displacement result that the XFEM approximation is not a nodal interpolant, interpolant. So with uh, applications of enriched displacement approximation, we have um, we get the the right side, of which is the uh, U of X equals N I times U I plus H times uh, N J times N A J, and then um, we also have N I equals uh, the N U um, subtrace standard, and then the H h times nj equals um, na, the enriched form. And then now we can use apply these equations. Now we can obtain the um, solution on the bottom for the uh, the XEM solution for the non-aligned mesh. Now we can um, look at the comparison for XFEM solution and uh, the standard FEM solution. On the left side is the numerical solution of a displacement field using the XFEM. Um, and we can see the exact solution, the um, red dot as the, um, uh, the standard one, the standard uh, FEM and then the U standard. And um, the green dots representing the U enriched. And then we also have the purple one as the U of X. And we can see that it's uh, a, a rather um, close solution comparing to the exact form. And on the right side, we have the numerical solution of cracked beam using the uh, standard FEM. So we can see the exact form is the blue line and the FEM is the, is the red, red line. So it's uh, um, for different questions, um, we, we use different approach, but for um, for the non-aligned mesh, mesh pr uh, problem, we um, have the we have uh, the XFEM solution as a better solution comparing to the um, standard FEM solution. And finally, we're going to move on to some example applications. One of the more interesting applications of XFEM for us is hydraulic fracturing. Here is a screenshot of a little bit of a paper that uh, Dr. Dahi did in 2013. And there's a link to his paper right there, the citation for it. A number of other people have um, done really good work on hydraulic fracturing propagation as well using XFEM. And they're linked here as well. And then sort of the big classic XFEM problem is crack propagation. 
as you can probably guess, looking at the formulas and examples we've done, it really does start with just following a crack. So uh, some of the best work, some of the seminal work on this has been done on crack propagation. And then there's some kind of neater new stuff too, like solidification uh, problems have been solved using XFEM, which is sort of the reverse of what we think, something turning into a solid, which is uh, breaking apart. And one last thing to touch on, there are a few commercial implementations of XFEM. Abacus, Phidios, and Morpheo all do this. Uh, on top of that, there's a bunch of research code out there, uh, implementations for MATLAB, and uh, a lot of code doing doing this in a lot of different places. But on a commercial level, it's it's widely available. Thank you for watching.